if you have any questions, please post them in the chat and someone from our staff will get back to you regarding the machines or compliance. Hi, welcome to the webinar. My name is Mike Salvi. And today I'm here with Eric Grill from Chainbytes, Bitcoin BTMs, and Jeremy Snyder from BTM Compliance. And today we're going to talk about how to successfully run a BTM business while remaining fully compliant. Eric, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and how Chainbytes got started? Sure. Uh, my name is Eric Grill. I'm the CEO of Chainbytes. Uh, I've been a software developer for about 30 some years. I found Bitcoin when I was working in financial services, in particular hedge fund space and uh, realized the need for on and off ramps uh, in and out of Bitcoin. It was early 2012, I believe. And uh, you know, I saw a need that people needed to be able to acquire Bitcoin and that really hasn't changed. It's still difficult to acquire Bitcoin even today. And, and so that's where Chainbytes uh, began its uh, journey into the Bitcoin ATM space. And Jeremy, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and how BTM Compliance started? Sure, my name is Jeremy Snyder. I'm the CEO of uh, BTM Compliance. I have a law enforcement background, and for the last 12 years, I've been doing a healthcare and financial tech software compliance. We started our business out of the necessity in order to assist operators with compliance. They functionally didn't have any systems like that um, because they were utilizing things like ATMs and the banks traditionally provided the compliance for them. So we began out of necessity to provide those operators those services. Okay. So... What is it that operators need to do to start a fully compliant BTM business? A great question. So operators need to first start with registration with uh, FinCent as an MSB or a money services business. And once they've completed that registration, which we help them with, uh, we implement an AML uh, KYC program. So in other words, a anti-money laundering and a know your customer program. Um, and then we also assign them a compliance officer. So after that, the real work really begins. Uh, we start with monitoring the transactions, assuring that customers are provided um, with the necessary information for each and every transaction. We assist with filing things like SARS, which are sus suspicious activity reports and CTRs, uh, currency transaction reports. And then we also provide the quarterly training that is required by FinCENT to the operators and their staff. And then of course, uh, the operators use all of this in, in conjunction with us in order to ensure that they're running their compliance program and that they're following their compliance regulation. Okay. So with all these options um, and all these things that need to be supported, Eric, how does Chainbytes Bitcoin BTMs come into play? Well, we provide the, uh, so a lot of people have their AML programs and then need to implement them into the software side of things to try to automate as much of that as possible. So we do things like SMS verification, government ID verification, uh, collection of social security numbers for the CTR reporting when they go over certain thresholds. But what, what we in this essence do is take what they've done in, as an AML program and implement that onto the software side. So say like from zero to $500, they need to do you know XYZ SMS verification, 500 to 1000, we need to collect government ID. Over 10,000, we need to collect the social security number, you know, occupation, those sort of things. And, uh, you know, that, that's how we implement it in, on the software side, but it's really dependent operator by operator and how they, how they want to do their AML program, their risk assessment and, and, and things of that nature. Okay. Jeremy, you brought up SARS or suspicious activity reports. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, sure. So suspicious activity reports or a SAR, um, these are required to be filed when any type of suspicious transaction has occurred, um, specifically an amount that's greater than uh, $2,000. And in order for it to be suspicious, the operator um, and the compliance officer needs to reasonably suspect that the transaction or a pattern of transactions um, is suspicious. So things like um, you know funds that have been derived from illegal activity. So obviously, if that's known, then, then that is suspicious. Um, anything that is designed to evade the requirements of the uh, Bank Secrecy Act, and uh, also through things like structuring, uh, you know, where someone can go through and and try to avoid those threshold limits. They may make a transaction, um, you know, on one business day, and then come in and visit either another machine. Um, or even the same machine on another day within a 24-hour period um, and not knowing that, that they're obviously trying to evade those standards. 
as an operator, basically, I would just say that, you know, if, if we're talking about it, it usually warrants a SAR. Uh, it, 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 at that point, something raised our suspicion. So that for us is the threshold that we use to, to do that. But, uh, you know, the structuring that he mentioned, a lot of times, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to identify in our systems because A, we take a snapshot of the user at the machine. We have all the transactions uh, that you can look at in the dashboard and the machine itself, you can set it so that it, it stops those types of transactions. You know, and, Pretty easy to identify. And Eric is right. I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, you know, if the transaction serves no business or apparent lawful purpose, a purpose, then the reporting is, is going to obviously be necessary. You also mentioned CTR. Can you talk to us about what a CTR is? Yeah. So the CTR is pretty simple. Uh, it's it's something that is the most often report that's filed by by us on behalf of the operators. Um, it's anything that's that's a transaction that is involving more than ten thousand um, dollars, either in cash in or even cash out on any one single day. One of the things I would also mention is that um, a CTR you can obviously need to tell the customer that you're filing a CTR and, and collecting additional information, uh, whereas a, a SAR you can't disclose to the customer that that's being filed. That's something that's uh, that's part of the Bank Secrecy Act that gets filed behind the scenes. Very good point. Um, and then also, you know, I think I kind of spoke to this, but aggregation. So aggregation is where multiple transactions um, can occur in that one day, and those things could be treated as one single transaction. Um, so a CTR must be filed uh, within 15 days, and uh, those copies are supposed to be kept for five years. Okay. So Jeremy, I understand you brought a video of somebody buying Bitcoin at one of the machines. I did, and I'm gonna share that with you guys right now. So I guess I'll narrate this. Um, so here we have the main screen here to buy Bitcoin. So they would select buy Bitcoin, which he just did. He would select the amount that he wants to buy, which he probably selected over 10,000. Uh, he's putting his phone number in at this point. Uh, then they sent him an SMS verification. He's entering that in into the machine here shortly. He's now going to scan his uh, his his government ID, <laughs> which I'm sure Jeremy loves, right? Great ID. Absolutely. I mean, actually, the the customer profile and the customer notes in particular with the chain by machines are, are particularly important. And you know, I'd like to note that these machines are, are phenomenal. They actually have all of the right compliance tools in order to help make our job uh, way easier and provide all of the information that we need. We're very, very happy when we have our customers come over to us and they state that they're going to be utilizing the chain bike software on their machine. Okay, so here he is. Now he's scanning his QR code after he had scanned his government ID. So uh, I'm gonna, now he's going to enter his uh, money into the machine. And confirming his purchase. And that's the end of his transactions. And now at this point, all of that information has been fed into our backend system. So Jeremy, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing. And I'll, uh, I'll start sharing. I'll show how that transaction actually looks on the back end. So here's, can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. So here's that transaction that John Doe just did, <laughs> the, thanks to uh, Scott. So you can see the order ID when it was created the status that it's been fulfilled, meaning that there's a transaction ID and this is actually on the blockchain right now. Uh, BitRank, which we're using for our forensic software. So you can see there was a new address that he used that had never existed before. You can see a picture of the customer in front of the machine. Uh, you can see the amount of Bitcoin that was sent. In that case, he just did what $10 transaction. Uh, price of Bitcoin at the uh, point in time of what we charged him and the spot price of what uh, the, the machine bought back that Bitcoin for. What the cost actually was, and then the profit for that on that ten dollars. His wallet address, which again you can look here uh, on different uh, on blockchain, block cipher, and of course the transaction ID, which again you can look at on two different blockchains. 
Uh, the customer is not approved. That's the first time we've seen him. And based upon his ID, I don't think he probably should approve him. Um, his phone number, his address, uh, what he entered into the machine, you can see that down here. Uh, we can drill into the customer itself and look at that customer. So in this case, you can see he's been at the machine and uh, you know, there's, there's his ID. <laughs> I'm sure John would like, like that ID right down there. <laughs> um, the key that that's his, his address and everything that was put in there, any notes that compliance or the operator wants to put about that customer. And every time that customer has been at the machine, you, you'll, you'll get all this together. You can also look at all the orders that that customer has done, which I'm not sure they've done any before. Oh, okay. So he's been, he's been at, yeah. uh, so you can see all the orders he's done at the machine. And it's uh, pretty much, that, that's the gist of it. Uh, you can look at the session itself and actually see where he clicked on the screen. Um, so this was his customer. This is the machine that he used here. Uh, you can see, you know, he clicked on buy, did a range, put in his SMS. You can actually see where he tapped and what he did. So literally from start to finish what he did on that machine. And that's all stored and recorded. So that's, that's pretty much it from the back end. That's, that's what he can look at. And then of course that customer, we have him in our database now. Uh, compliance can, can do what they need to do there. That's pretty much the, uh, the dashboard side of the uh, AML process. Of course, the AML system has already been put into there. So that's why it required him to provide his SMS verification and his government ID based on the amount of Bitcoin that he, he selected he wanted to buy. Jeremy, I understand you don't charge as much to your customers when they come to you with Chainbytes software. Why is that? Yeah, that's actually a really great question. So Chainbytes, as a manufacturer of both the machines and, and the software, they've taken into account all of the compliance features that are necessary um, in order for us to do our jobs and assist the operators, where it could be problematic for the operators if they're not collecting up all of the necessary information, as you just saw from Eric's demonstration of what those dashboards look like. So these machines that, that we support, obviously it's, it's just because it preserves the integrity for, for our clients. It just makes it that much easier. Okay. Now we saw limits. Um, what happens when customers try to avoid these limits? <laughs> yeah, so action then needs to be taken. So this is why we're here. Uh, we're here to advise the operators, uh, file the appropriate reports over to FinCEN. And, you know, we do all of that legwork for you. So while we obviously ask all the questions of our operators, uh, you know, as far as like, who was the ID, what was, or who was using the ID, what was the transaction, um, you know, did they complete a SMS registration, do we have their social security numbers, whatnot, we get that information from them, we file the suspicious activity reports, uh, we filed the different uh, currency transaction reports on their behalf. Um, we really just take care of a lot of the legwork for our operators. All right, so Eric, in these different processes, how do these machines help? Uh, well, I mean, what we've done is we've looked at what compliance need to, needs to do, especially here in the United States, and we've added the feature. So when we see a lot of collection of information on, on certain things or SARS and CTRs, we've looked at what that information is. Um, when, when customers try to avoid transactions, what we can do to help uh, alleviate that as far as um, blacklisting the, the phone numbers, the wallet addresses. When we've identified scam addresses, we were able to do that. We've integrated uh, forensic software on the back end to, to provide the compliance officer with, with a better view of overall uh, what that transaction is. Uh, other things that we see are like scams and, and people actually being scammed at the machine. And what we're able to do there is, is provide other tools to help uh, the operators as well as the compliance officers identify those people that potentially could be getting scammed. So, uh, we may put an order on hold automatically, which then needs to be cleared um, by the compliance officer. And a lot of times that would, you know, that requires them calling and talking to the customer and saving the customer from being scammed, quite frankly. So uh, we've, we've been able to do a lot of that through, you know, our experience over the years of just seeing various things that have, that have happened at the machines. And, and we've been able to really stop a lot of that. And of all, all Chainbytes models feature all these? Yes. Yeah, the software that runs across the machines is the same, regardless of which model that they're running. Okay. Jeremy, can you talk about some of the services that BTM Compliance offers? Yeah, absolutely. So 
obviously we're here to support our operators. And one of those things that we do in order to help support the operators is provide the quarterly training, which is a requirement from FINSA. So we actually go through and create different training programs and provide those electronically for our operators. So that way they can take those on their own. Um, we do test them in order to make sure that there's a competency tied there. Um, but that's, that's definitely a huge thing in order to ensure that your staff is obviously educated and they know exactly when transactions you know, either meet or, or don't exceed the threshold and what the reporting criteria are for those. Um, one of the other things that we do is we offer third party audits of the operator's existing compliance. And this is required annually by FinCEN. So we can go through and actually look at the different controls of your compliance program and ensure that you're following those things and then report those standards. So when you are audited um, by FinCEN, you can provide those reports to show that you have the audits completed. Okay. And so for those third party audits, uh, th those are those are typically other operators that would come to you not using your services day to day, but in fact, using other people as services and then they're coming to you and saying, hey, audit my program and look at that, right? Correct, because FinCEN, they actually regulate and state that the compliance officer can't be the one who's actually, you know, com completing and providing that audit service. So what we do is we'll actually go through and do those third party audits for people who are not using our compliance services. Okay. All right. So for this next question, uh, this is really this is aimed at both of you. So uh, the both of you can chime in as as much as you like. But um, can you just walk me through the process of buying machines and becoming compliant? Sure. Eric, you want to start since it starts with the machine? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, first they would contact our sales department and and you know obviously talk to them about what their requirements are as far as the machines, location, um, currencies that they that they want to support. Uh, so they, they buy the machine from us, um, and while the machines are being manufactured and shipped to them, they would be then working with uh, compliance and coming up with their program so that when they receive their machines, uh, they were ready to go. And I guess that's where, where Jeremy fits in. That's exactly where we come in. So we get in touch with, with you as a customer or as an operator, um, and we determine what your needs are. Uh, we'll create a, a dedicated Slack channel for communication directly with us. Um, we help and fill out all of the paperwork for your FinCEN registration. Uh, we even electronically file that, um, and then we eventually will get returned a BSA number. And then we create your compliance program. We go over that, that compliance program with you to ensure that you understand what the threshold and the limits are, so that way you can, you can follow that. Um, you're issued a compliance officer who stays you know, with you for the duration of your compliance services. And um, at that point, we then begin to provide you with training material so that way you understand exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, and then on the chain bike side, the machines will eventually arrive for you. And then that's where you're going to start your setup. And I think Eric can kind of talk through exactly what that looks like. Yeah, when uh, at that point you have your compliance program, you're ready to go. Uh, you may also get your banking in order uh, after you get your compliance, but uh, then the machine arrives. Basically all you need is a uh, power supply, internet, connection, uh, it's plug and play. Uh, we, we handle all of that. Uh, we then give you a dashboard walkthrough. So sort of what I showed you there was just the customer profile, but you know, there's a lot more to the dashboard than that. So helping you set up your compliance that you've already put together well, with BTM compliance or, or another compliance company, they put that together and we implement that in the software so that um, you're ready just to deliver your machine within you know, a day or two after receiving your machine. Uh, so all this, this stuff kind of fits together. Um, and then, you know, ongoing, uh, Jeremy and his team uh, provide the compliance services. And, yeah. yeah, we'll immediately get a login and we'll begin to do the monitoring. We'll begin to ensure that the transactions um, are going through and that if there are any that need or meet the standards for either, you know, a SAR or a CTR um, that we're assisting and letting you know, um, most likely you're going to be letting us know. And uh, we also provide, you know, again, the quarterly training and then those yearly audits. All right, and any, any issues or problems that you have, you can certainly call uh, Chainbytes and, and we're, we're there to support you and your operations. So questions you may have. A, a lot of new operators, are, are, you know, they go through the dashboard and then, you know, maybe a few days later, they get something that they don't understand because it's a new transaction. And so we're there to help them. And most operators need to use those services for at least the first month. Once once they get going and they get a few transactions under their belt, 
uh, then they're mostly working with compliance and, and doing those sorts of things. They understand the basic operations of their machine. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we're here at the end of the day too in order to help you guys uh, succeed. We provide those tools, we provide uh, the insight and, and the professional advice as far as you know what do you need to be doing next and are you staying compliant with your compliance program? Okay. All right, well, great. Um, where can people go to get more information? So from the BTM compliance side, you can go right on over to our website at btmcompliance.com. Uh, all of our information is there. You can uh, schedule a meeting and uh, speak with any of our staff in, in order to talk through some of the services and how those things may apply to you specifically. Okay, right. And you can go to chainbytes.com. That's C-H-A-I-N-B-Y-T-E-S.com and uh, see all the different models that we offer and the services that we provide. All right. Gentlemen, Eric Grill, Jeremy Snyder, thank you both for your time. Thanks to everybody who watched. If you have any questions, go to chainbytes.com, btmcompliance.com. Thanks for attending. See you next time. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, everybody.